something that feels true in my mind. And one of the things is that, uh, that lives that one might not consider eventful or rich can in fact be profoundly rich and, and dramatic, uh, even it, though the drama is not expressed in any form that's visible to another person. Um, and since, since John Ames is a pastor, he articulates thoughts and feelings and so on in a way that someone else might not. But the basic interest for me is in the fact that, that people feel deeply and experience richly and, uh, you know. I grew up, as I said before, in a very thinly populated part of the country, just um, about 40 miles from the Canadian border in the mountains on a lake. And um, I was the fourth generation in my family to live there, which is very unusual because, you know, nobody else came, basically. Um, the um, habit of solitude is very deep in my family. It's hard to know, you know, I mean, for me, it's important that I can be solitary because I need to feel that I can think a thought from the beginning to the end. <laughs> or that if something is beginning to weigh in my mind, I can let it develop without distraction. I don't even have a functioning landline telephone, in, you know. to write before I had any conception that there was such a thing as a professional writer. I, I was just, you know, on my own as far as that sort of thing is concerned. I wrote poetry when I was a child. I read all the time. Um, I knew that, you know, some books were by Dickens, but I had no idea about Dickens, you know, and so on. Um, so I actually was writing a, a good while before I had any idea of writing. And then um, when I wrote Housekeeping, um, I wrote it thinking it was unpublishable. I had sort of fun trying to write an unpublishable novel. And uh, then a friend of mine sent it to an agent without telling me he was going to do that. And I got a letter from the agent saying she would be happy to represent it. And so suddenly I was a professional writer. Without <laughs> 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 yes, I guess so. <laughs> And when I'm talking to my students, I always say, always keep something in front of the reader's eye, in the imagination. And, and Frank, uh, Pat Kilney is very good at that. You know, that the beautiful images at the beginning about the sleeping compound and so on. I hope that they will see this world with their very interesting, very visual sensibilities, you know. The concert is all for this audience, but especially for you. I mean, many things have been lovely, but uh, the thoughtfulness of it, the, the, uh, it was very moving to me that uh, he played the, the World Symphony, uh, that he, he directed that, because uh, because Dvorak did live in a Czech settlement in Iowa for some time, 
and uh, we, we identify with you very strongly. Mm -hmm. To me, that sounds like Iowa, even though I know New York and all sorts of other things. Um, and needless to say, that uh, his own culture. Second anchor is just for you. It's almost a happy accident to be an internationally interesting <laughs> writer because uh, I, frankly, I, I don't think about readership very much. You know, I'm, what I'm focused on trying to think about where the substance of the fiction seems to be. Um, I'm, you know, it's wonderful and gratifying to find that international readers are interested in what I do, but it's more as if they. They create this reality rather than I, you know, rather than my creating it. You know, mm -hmm. um, I, if I were to try to speak to an international audience, I think I would perhaps overgeneralize and and lose mm -hmm. the sense that there is a humanity at the core of it all. You know, mm -hmm. and um, I think that uh, one of the things that makes people want to write is the feeling of this sort of disproportion between. Mm. what actually happens in their lives as they experience them and what they're actually able to utter, represent mm. to other people. In using the methods of classic Russian and European literature to explore lives and landscapes that are altogether Korean, she acknowledged both the distinctiveness of Korean life and history and their rightful place in the larger testimony art has made to the difficult beauty of the human presence in the world. Then there is the example of Pak Kyung Ni, whose privilege and joy it was to find that she spoke to the heart of her country. The many hours of lonely and concerted thought represented by her impressive body of work can be seen as an opulent gift, and her evocations of love and pleasure and sorrow can be seen as a blessing on every life as surely as if she stood by to witness the courage that underlies all humanity, lived out in despite of hardship and oppression. She reminds us all that few things can matter more than a good book. She reminds us that solitude engrossed in generous and scrupulous thought can be an embrace of the world whose warmth and breadth few human acts can begin to approximate. This prize and the example of the writer in whose honor it is given both assert the fact that literature, however closely attentive it is to place and culture and language, is at the same time international. This is true because to be human is the same everywhere and beautifully different from place to place. I have learned that the moon can be seen as a widow dressed in white. I will never again look at the moon without remembering that her silence her slow walk through the chambers of the night sky can be seen as full of human sadness and dignity. Oh, well, certainly. Well, I mean, the, the objects are simply beautiful in their own right, you know. Um, also, it's just so, uh, it seems as if the idea of printing very quickly turned into a way to develop ornamentation across a whole field of life. And, and, you know, which is very brilliant. And I don't think we have anything quite like that in historical printing in, you know, in medieval Europe. The, uh, the, it's just touching to me that people from such an early point wanted to make anything beautiful that they could find a way to make beautiful, you know. Um, the, the patience and skill and so on that these artifacts are full of is just very moving. The question of Christian humanism is very important for me. I, I, I'm a Renaissance scholar by training, and I read Renaissance, you know, Reformation theology. And one of the things that is very important to me is the insistence on simply the absolute value of any human being as such. You know, the brilliance, the the poignancy, the you know, amazing capacities that human beings have. I really feel as though, in order to restore the integrity 
of religious faith in this period, we actually have to relearn reverence toward human beings. And uh, so exploring that idea is very, very important in everything that I write. Oh, many impressions. <laughs> but certainly, um, the, the overriding impression is of an enormous kindness and thoughtfulness and graciousness. It, it really has been wonderful. Um, and then, of course, you know, so much of terrain is beautiful. The mountains are, are wonderful. And, and it's interesting to see another modern society developing on other principles and aesthetics and so on. Um, it, it, it complicates the idea of the modern in a way that nothing else has ever done for me. You know, when you look at France or something, it's more as if they're avoiding modernity. <laughs> and, you know, which Korea certainly is not doing, you know, so it's very interesting. Um, I tell my students to respect their interests. If they find themselves interested in, you know, space, or they find themselves interested in bacteria, or they find, you know, anything, um, that has been more or less what I have done in my life, just give myself over to one thing after another. But, but you have to have a broader base than simply literature itself in order to have the confidence that you need to write well. So, um, I'm, you know, any writer, I think, says if you want to be a writer, read. And I say that too, but read widely. And, and if you have an appetite for some particular field, you know, do it. You know, be good at it. That's very important. I have wondered from time to time why so many people want to write. But then I have wondered from time to time why I want to write. The impulse is there and nothing else will satisfy it. I must try to find the words that would give shape to thoughts that for some reason cannot be resolved until I find the words for them. I must assume that the same impulse lies behind all that writing that goes on all across the continent, which is so invisible to the world at large. Writing can open the way to a close acquaintance with one's own mind, and this is always interesting. It pleases me to think of the tens or hundreds of thousands who make this exploration alone and together. It is also, for the most part, a solitary and isolating experience. To be able to think and talk about it with people who are themselves attempting it is a good way to understand something of the workings of the mind of language, and of the processes of creation. An exploration of the question, and it is a statement about it. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very, very aware that, that for all purposes we live in our minds. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. And um, the things like, you know, the associations that someone makes, that makes him or her feel the situation differently than anyone else would feel the same situation and so on. This, this is a very primary reality to me, um, that people are living out the consequences of culture and economy and, and event, you know, continuously. I think I will know what I can know about my vision of reality when I've finished writing.